By 20, 2030, we will have uh, 70% of our electricity coming from renewables. You will see solar parks um, as you drive through the countryside. You will see, um, I think, movement, would you believe, to hydrogen cars and not electric cars. So anybody who's bought a Tesla can probably need to think again. The Architects of Business, with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to the Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where you'll hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon, broadcasting remotely from my home at this time. And on this week's show, I chat with John Mullins, the executive chairman of Amarenko Solar, an Irish energy company who believe that sustainable sun energy can curb climate change. They're harvesting all around the world and in Cork. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe to get brand new shows directly into your feed. You are very welcome to the Architects of Business, John Mullins, Executive Chairman of Amarenko Solar. Um, a company that the general public might not be hugely familiar with, um, but a huge amount going on in the background. And John, in a way, you have reshaped um, the understanding of solar in Ireland from a very um, good position within the energy sector. Mm. It, I guess looking back at your story, um, it, it, it maybe started in a very, very different place. You, you're a Cork man, loud mm. and proud, um, mm. and and your your beginnings uh, wouldn't necessarily have pointed to to this position. No, I pro- probably not. Uh, I, I, my, my mother grew up on the street where we have our headquarters. Would you believe? And um, that's amazing. A bit of nostalgia attached to that. Um, so. Uh, my my father um, uh, was a a painter decorator in uh, in Cork Corporation. Worked with the council. Um, and my mother uh, was a part time cleaner and used to clean the offices in AIB sixty six South Mall, which is one of the the great edifices of of Cork City. And um, uh, we were in a two up two down in Fourth Street. I was born in just south south in the city and. Uh, um, we were waiting for a council house until I think 1976, and then we moved to the north side of the city into a brand new estate at the time, which is uh, Knocknahini at the very top of the north side. And um, I, I went to the North Monastery. Um, I, I think it, when, when I moved from Sullivan's Key to North Monastery, I think um, the brothers up there thought I had some reading deficiency. So I was put on special reading uh, duties in second class. And, and then I gradually improved. I suppose that the education was good. The brothers uh, were quite strict, uh, but uh, but in my view, quite fair, and uh, had a good education. And um, uh, and I, I did everything sport uh, in in the North Mon: athletics, basketball, hurling, football. Just loved everything like that. And as my mother said, it kept me off the street. Um, and uh, yeah, so 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 I was the the first. Uh, uh, member of my family on both sides to go to university. And so the the leaning towards the sciences, when did that emerge? Um, well, I, maths was, I was strong in maths going through primary and secondary school. And then, of course, then you got exposed to science in junior cert or inter cert as it was. And then I chose physics and chemistry. So quite clearly, my, my senior cycle was definitely orientated towards the sciences because I had a bent in, in that regard. And and uh, I was doing quite well. Um, so so I, I would say, by the, and I, I have this experience out with my own kids, like, you know, they're now in college, but 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 more recently they would have gone through this that cycle themselves. And, you know, it is very difficult for kids today and kids back then to understand what the hell am I going to do when I grow up? Hmm. Um, so um, I suppose at the time there was kind of a points race as there is today uh, uh, to get into the top level courses um, because of a scientific bent, I had no interest in medicine or dentistry because I hate blood. Um, and <laughs> and uh, so, so I, I, I then went for electrical engineering and, and, and that's how I ended up in, in, in UCC in, in, in 85. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you thrived in that environment with your, your learning and your, your, your drive to improve. What happened straight afterwards? 
Um, and I suppose in, in, in terms of uh, when I left college, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed myself in college, Sonia. Anybody who knows me knows that uh, I, I'd be a I'm getting a sense of that, John. I'm yeah. getting a sense of it. <laughs> so I, I used to debate with people like Brendan O'Connor and people like that in college. So, so, Brilliant. so and, and uh, I was in a rock band and, and all of those things that you had to do. Um, but then try and keep. That I think there's another well. podcast in here somewhere. No, 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 there's not. <laughs> I, I, what I'd say is that I enjoyed my time in in, in university, and um, I suppose in '89 it was a terrible time, Sonia. You might remember. I mean, it was uh, it was not a great time. It was ahead of you know ahead of Jack Charlton's 1990. Um, yeah. There weren't that many jobs, and it was highly competitive to get a job at the time. And I was fortunate that I got an offer of a position by by ESB. And I ended up uh, going to Dublin at 21, uh, uh, living in Sandy Mount in a, uh, in, a, in, a in an interesting uh, uh, rental and uh, um, and started work for ESB back then. Um, and and within about a year, I was uh, keeping the lights on by night uh, in the National Grid Control Centre. So, which was a, a fabulous experience. Because your your career is kind of defined by this prescience. This, this sort of almost um, predictive ability. Um, wh- where did that come from and what drove you to that particular area? Um, I you know people in life, I think Sonia have, have, have intuition, but intuition is always informed as well. So you, you, your intuition gets improved with experience and, and as a result, uh, you see certain trends happening and I think um, that's one of the things I would have learned through the UI program. A lot of entrepreneurs see things around corners that most people don't see, or they see solutions for problems that people haven't asked about yet. And, and I think that really is, is, is kind of core. So I, I suppose um, if you go through your journey in life and you're forever questioning or challenging either yourself or, or the context which you're in, you, you'll always actually start thinking about what's next. Um, so, I mean, I've had plenty of examples of that, you know, even prior to, to, to Amarinko, where you take bold moves essentially with a company and, and, uh, and you push the envelope out effectively. So, but you see certain trends and you read certain signals. You don't always get it right, by the way, yeah. because, you know, there's always going to be failure uh, as well as success. Um, but you try and use the wealth of your experiences, you've built it up to really refine that intuition. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm an engineer, Sonia. When I try and make a decision, I always actually look at what the debits and credits are or what the decision tree actually looks like. So I have a very logical approach. I try and put subjectivity into logic and, and then use that as the basis for, for moving forward. What happened then? Uh, what was the, the duration of ESB and what happened next? I mean, over a number of interactions, I was there for, I think, eight years in total. I I, um, I worked in operations. I worked in distribution. I worked in, as I say, the control center. I worked with then more laterally with ESB International and was involved in their biggest investment still, I think, overseas, which was uh, I directed the project in and more to be at an outside of Bilbao, which was an 800 megawatt power plant. So uh, I, I think at the time I was about, I don't know, 32, 33 years of age. At Amazing. That stage. So, yeah. So, but it was and, a, a, and a fantastic experience. company, a fantastic company as well, and, and stands very tall on its, its culture yes. and its uh, ethos and philosophy. So it must have been a great learning ground for you in terms of how a big company works. Well, yeah, I mean, back then, I mean, I think we need to remember that that when I joined ESB, it was a monopoly. It was, it's, it, it, you know, essentially it didn't have competitors as you have today. It did all of the planning for energy in the country uh, when it came to electricity. Um, it wasn't involved in gas and, and other things as it is today. Um, ESBI was just actually really coming together at that stage. Um, and the view was, look, Um, because there was going to be changes in the Irish market, ESB needs to decide about investments abroad. And in that regard, that's how I ended up being uh, involved in in, in the project in in Spain. It was a a fabulous experience, but I was surrounded by very brilliant engineers and very brilliant accountants and lawyers. uh, And it's a company I have the highest respect for, even though later in my career, I had to take them on in combat with respect to the big switch and Borgosh and all of that. But hopefully so you, you've done, 
Well, well, let's move on to that because you, you've you've done really well um, in ESB. You've you've brokered major deals. You've you've uh, found yourself in a position of high power, um, and then you left. Yeah, I um, I, I moved. Uh, uh, well, I, I moved to NTR. I, I um, um, and I I was uh, I, I was uh, I suppose Jim Barry, who now heads up alternative investments for BlackRock. I knew him from my university days. Uh, we met um, and said, look, would I be interested in going across? Because um, they had just taken 51% of electricity, if you remember that Eddie O'Connor uh, had, had founded that. And um, um, I, I went in to NTR to, to really assist in terms of understanding where, where that business was going to go. And that business grew very rapidly. And I remember the first... Um, uh, movements by electricity into Scotland and then into the United States. And of course, that business was sold for 1.8 billion enterprise value. Um, and, and as we speak, Eddie's going through, <coughs> excuse me, a, a similar uh, exercise with, with, with his second company, Mainstream. Um, but but you, you were surrounded by people who were entrepreneurs and corporate entrepreneurs. And, and during that journey, excuse me, <coughs> during that journey, we, we, we ended up uh, going to the United States and setting up an ethanol business with Richard Banton's people um, wow. in, in, uh, in Nebraska, Indiana, and Tennessee. In fact, uh, it was a great opening um, in northwestern Tennessee of our ethanol plant, which was 100 million gallons of ethanol. Remember, this is alcohol, right? And um, it was in a dry county. So if you wanted a drink, you had to go all the way down to Memphis to have one, right? So three wow. hours away. But we were producing 100 million gallons of ethanol, which, by the way, was being uh, splashed into gasoline uh, in the United States. So we were converting corn to ethanol uh, and then creating uh, distiller's grains that went off to Texas steers to produce the, the beef in the United States. So, wow. But that business now was then, uh, <clears throat> then combined with another business, and it's now on the NASDAQ. So the origins of a NASDAQ company actually originated through that experience. So, so uh, uh, but I wasn't there for, for the listing uh, because I got a phone call one day getting off a jet in Pittsburgh. Um, would I be interested in heading up uh, board? Gosh, I said to myself, look, I'm 39 years of age. Jim Barry's not going anywhere. So um, I decided, look, I'd go for the interview. And I gave them a certain vision about the fact that they needed to be a dual fuel utility, uh, that they needed to get into electricity. They had a big gas background, and that was about it. They were about to build a, a power plant in Whitegate in Cork. And I had that renewable experience as well. So And so that, yeah. that vision was there from the start. Yeah, I mean, thought even the, before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I gave the presentation at the interview. I said, this is what I'd like to do. And clearly people uh, took it on board. And I implemented that program um, over the five years. And I um, I remember going into Project McManus, who was the ESB CEO at the time. I knew him, of course, but I hadn't worked in ESB. And I said, look, I, I have to apologize, Project, that, you know, we have this power plant and I'm going to have to enter the residential market. I hope you don't mind. I don't worry about that, he said. You know, so that was fine until we took a half a million customers off ESB. Ooh. Well, at least you were polite about it, John. <laughs> I know. I, 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 by the way, I, I happened to be Padraig recently, and, and we're, we're nothing but polite with each other. Um, but in a way, it did ESB a favor because it accelerated the liberalization of the market, which really uh, the regulator had been pushing. And at the time, the Lucy Kennedy ads had, had worked quite well. We were very happy with the To say the least. It. I think it's extraordinary when you when you think about what you achieved from getting that phone call mm. in Pittsburgh to five years <clears> later, <throat> that transformation of that company is pretty extraordinary. Um, and, and I suppose it, it could only come to you from your wealth of experience that that there was something else mm. out there. When did that moment come for you? Well, I suppose I had worked in London with PwC and I had consulted with with companies that were ahead in the cycle in Europe. Where we, where they had, um, they had liberalised and they had opened up their market well ahead of the Irish market. So I knew exactly what the trends were, what the what the tricks of the trade had been effectively in the UK. And in essence, I was just basically taking all of that learning and saying, right, 
this is what was successful in the United Kingdom, um, particularly in England and Wales. Um, um, a dual fuel offering is exactly what is needed here. In addition to that, uh, the trend to decarbonization is really happening. And I remember raising a bond for Borgash in 2009. Now, this is in the middle of a crisis. We raised a 500 million euro bond after a, a roadshow right across Europe, which was exhausting. And we got some we got some reaction from some countries, right, with, and some investor communities, which was not good because they did not view Ireland as a, a good place, particularly after... Uh, uh, the crash. But um, we went out on the basis that we were going to spend one third of the money raised on gas pipelines and two thirds of the money on renewable electricity. And we got the bond away and the bond came in uh, cheaper than what the government was raising debt over a five-year period. Wow. And, and primarily because we were seen as a more solid Bet than the sovereign at that time. And remember, the Troika were just about to join us in Marine Street at that time. That's extraordinary. So with Amarenko then, when, yes. when did that begin its journey? <clears throat> it began when I became unemployed on the 1st of January 2013. Fair um, enough. <laughs> yeah. I, was, uh, I was just after my family just, uh, just left... Uh, I remember the Ormond Hotel in Kilkenny, and uh, I was on my way back to hand in my laptop, hand in my car. Um, the next thing I had to do was to uh, go up to the airport, hire uh, a car uh, until I got myself a new one. Um, I had no office. I had no PAs anymore. I had none of the... Sorry, John, was, this was on the back of the privatization of the company. No, this was on the back of leaving Borgash. I, I, I was offered a two-year extension. I, I didn't go for it. I decided I was going to go in and, and try something for myself. Um, so self-inflicted unemployment. Self-inflicted unemployment, a personal choice. Um, and you had to have the confidence that you were going to go and do something. So... Uh, I had some reserve, personal reserves and decided that um, I'd go and, and, and look into uh, what was um, essentially uh, an emerging opportunity for me, which was uh, uh, the idea that solar was, was, was going to happen. It was accelerating uh, its prevalence in international energy markets because the price of solar uh, panels was coming down, as were inverters and all of the kit attached to, to this. So therefore, it was becoming a, a lot cheaper. Uh, and um, I hooked up with uh, a number of former colleagues and we, we created a company, basically. And uh, then I went about raising money, raised the first 500,000, uh, tried to raise 150 million with a, a very prominent bank in London, did a roadshow there, failed miserably. But we had one project and there's a picture of the project, uh, not the one you see behind me, but further up the boardroom. And um, <clears throat> I had to raise 5.2 million euros of retail money to make it happen. So um, I had to make something like 300 cold calls to pension brokers across the country to get this project over the line. And we kept on telling the German company that the money's on its way, the money's on its way. Um, but we finally got there and closed that. And then uh, fortunately, um, um, we got the support of uh, Ian Quinn, an entrepreneur himself, uh, out of Kragana, uh, and uh, he invested in a couple of assets which we uh, uh, pulled together for him. Uh, and then uh, we also then went out and raised more retail money, but more formally through people like Harvest Financial Services and Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, who we now have a, a very good relationship with. And, and by the time we knew it, we had five plants in France. Uh, we didn't have a fund. They came from different sources. It was a lot of uh, knocking on doors uh, to raise the money for each of these. But we had the capability to understand the engineering in the team and also understand the corporate finance. There was about five of us at the out outset. Uh, we now have over 140 people working for us worldwide. Uh, and Amazing. I think we have can done I, Can I ask you, John, deals. 24 deals. Now, 24, yeah, 24 deals in terms of, of financing. Yeah, 24, 24 projects, so this is portfolios. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. financing. So the, it, it's it's interesting because this the, the model of this business is extremely hungry. So you need to keep oh, yeah. raising the funds to 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 release yeah. the potential in the company, um, and 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 yet it is unbelievably revenue generating. Well, the, the beauty of renewable projects generally, whether it's wind or, or solar projects, is that you know for every one euro that you you earn, uh, you'll probably get about eighty two cents. EBITDA. That's quite a margin. Yeah. So so the operating costs of renewable assets are actually quite low. Uh, but that's why we leverage them and we get banks to come in to take at least 70% generally of the, the capital cost of these assets. And then we would add 30%. And in that regard, we've also added things like junior debt and crowdfunding as part of the mix so that I the, love this piece. Now, this yeah. you 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 uh, have had a sort of a gravitational pull towards France, I think, in terms of funding. Yes, yes, indeed. And, 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 also, projects. Ha- and also projects. And also projects. Talk to me about about this crowdfunding piece because the mechanism of it is fascinating. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's it's uh, and I I really wouldn't and I've I've been in touch with people like David McRedmond, who I know quite well from the Post about looking at this. Uh, and I've spoken to AIB about this, uh, um, amongst others. The, 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 there was a, a, a group that we knew in Bordeaux called LUMO, L-U-M-O. Took, it was taken over by SOCGEN, by the way, uh, Société Générale. And they started this process of putting a project, a picture of a project up on the portal and inviting people basically to uh, put it 100 euros or 1,000 euros. The, the average investment in these projects projects on a crowdfunding basis is about 1200 euros so people were right. putting savings essentially in there but they were guaranteed four and a half percent per annum now show me a deposit account that will give you four and a half percent and you get paid ahead of the developer behind the senior debt but ahead of the promoter of the project so in essence unless something catastrophic happens to a project you're assured that your 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 money is going to be there and you'll get repaid. And it's underpinned then by a financial institution it's under, who are putting it, up the capital. The, well, the, it's a, it's under it's 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 enabled by a financial institution that have the professional capability to look at the nature of the asset and say this is an asset for you, this is an asset I think you should invest in. And 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 they get 4 to 5% for about 4 years. And then we were to go about refinancing that asset once the asset is up and running and has proved itself, et cetera. But the idea here is that you could put a number of these renewable projects up on a portal, raise money, just a bit like what linked finance or grid finance do, sure. Sonia, in the context of other sure. sectors. And you're dealing with an asset that is government backed from the fact that the revenue, once the sun shines, you get paid by the government, right? And you know what the operating cost base is, and you know there's enough cash in the business to pay out the coupon every year and to refinance you after four years. We've we've so much to get through, and we've so little time left. Um, in in one quick answer, uh, how how long do you think it would be hypothetically before you could get an, an organization or a, an arrangement like that up in Ireland? I, I think you could get this up and running within six months. That's I, why. I, I, that's why yeah. you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't see. I don't see a reason why. I mean, look, the reality is, Sonia, you and I uh, uh, cannot make money out of a bank deposit. Our pensions now are actually going to have negative interest rates against us going forward. You know, if you want to have a pension pot in the future, you're going to have to take a wee bit of risk, right? And by investing in assets like this, it makes. It's real sense because it supports the decarbonization of our community. But it also actually means that you have more money in your pocket when it comes to retirement or when you want to actually, you know, liquidate that particular deposit. And your power to saving the planet, which is all there you good. Go. Talk, talk to me about Cove. Um, because uh, I mean, mm. I think for for the average listener or viewer, um, the, the the decrease in costs um, in solar power has been yes. quite extraordinary. Yes, it has, and you know, module prices have come down by eighty percent in the last five years. Um, uh, it's a significant reduction, mm-hmm. primarily motivated by the fact that nine of the ten 
top module manufacturers are Chinese. They have a very serious decarbonization program in China, uh, and they have some of the largest solar farms in the world. Um, they are increasing that production capacity as we go forward. Uh, the expectation is that we will have uh, 13 million megawatts of solar in the world by 2050. Now, by the way, all of Ireland is 10,000 megawatts of all power, just to put that in context. So the scale of solar uh, in terms of its deployment between 2020 and 2050 is enormous. And, and, and the, am I right in the tariffs... Down. Yeah, the tariffs have only just been released now for Ireland. Is that right? Yeah, so we just put a competition in and, and you talked about Cove. Cove is now qualified. We won 40 megawatts through eight projects this week. We'll be building next year in Ireland for the first time, which we're delighted to say is a big plus for us. Uh, I, I was one of the first to go out and meet the farmers uh, five years ago and they've stayed with me and I'm thankful for that. Um, but we have a number of other projects on the way. In the recent auction, the average price of solar was 73 euros a megawatt hour. That's seven cents a unit in, in bill terms. Um, wind and solar together, the average price was 74.5. So actually, solar is now, would you believe, becoming competitive with wind in an Irish context, which we were only a one-trick pony in this country with respect to renewable energy for 25 years, which was all onshore wind. We now actually have this mix of onshore wind and, and solar, and I think you'll see that solar will dominate the new bills in renewable energy in Ireland until such time as offshore uh, wind uh, uh, you know, gets moving, which is probably going to be 2025 by the time you see uh, the first major projects built. But it's so a very you, good time when, for solar at this stage. So when you see a publication of uh, stats around, you know, this being the dullest July that we've had, is that yeah. a problem for you? Well, you know, over, over the longer term, our, you know, um, solar radiation doesn't change that much, right? So you may have plus, a five, plus or minus 5%. So if I take the assets in France, you know, we've assets all over France in Guadeloupe and we have them in Reunion Island in the, in the Indian Ocean. We have them in Corsica. We would say plus or minus 5% over the year. You could have a fantastic January, February and March. We had an excellent April from memory. Um, uh, during lockdown, thankfully kept us all safe. Certainly did. And 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 we've had a very poor July, no doubt about that. But you do get months that make up for that. Um, you but, level out. You know, yeah, absolutely. But but we're building projects now in Spain that don't need a tariff. We're building projects in Oman that don't need, need a tariff. In Thailand that don't need a tariff. I mean, you know, we're we're now in markets that don't need subsidy. They are the cheapest form of new electricity in those markets. And the reason why is that the irradiation levels are between 1,500 and 2,000 hours a year. In Cloyne or in Cove, it's about 1,000 hours. So you can understand that there's quite a differential. Um, in France, in the south of France, are about 1,500 to 1,600 hours a year of sunshine at full load. So, so we know exactly how tariffs are going to be structured going forward. But for solar to be at 72 euros a megawatt hour on average in Ireland is a massive change from when we started looking at this. I would say that we were looking at tariffs of uh, um, 130. So, so all of a sudden you're in your own future. And yes. I mean, I think this, the story is phenomenal, what you've done and, and every sort of um, stepping stone that you've taken to this point. Um, you are uh, on this podcast because you are an EY Entrepreneur of the Year mm. alumni, uh, alumnus. Uh, what has that meant to you? What, what has been the value of that to you and the well, importance I mean, of it? Well, I, I, I was at a number of the EY functions uh, many years ago, actually, when I was CEO of Borgas. I was invited a number of times to, to, to attend. And I always found the stories phenomenal, right? And then, of course, when... I was president of the Cork Chamber of Commerce for two years and I was involved heavily in the chamber and I would have got to know a lot of entrepreneurs in the Cork region over that period. And, and you know, they're, they're, they're inspiring people. Um, and you kind of say to yourself, you know, and I say this to myself, sorry, life is not a dress rehearsal. That's why I decided not to take the contract in 2012. That's why I decided to go off and, and do something and have the strength of my own convictions to go about and do something. I'm surrounded 
in the alumni by people who have done crazy things in the eyes of their friends and family, but they have been extremely successful. They know what failure is about and they know how to learn. They know how to actually, when you meet them, swap ideas, you know, have a contact sheet, help each other out. And certainly you could see that in the middle of lockdown, how people were trying to help each other out. What they're trying and to co-create. do. And co create. Isn't there a sort and, of a creative and, energy around it? It's phenomenal. And in addition to that, Sonia, you know, you look at the sort of insurance uh, uh, um, issues that businesses have in Ireland. The alumni is very serious about dealing with uh, public liability insurance issues, essentially, because a lot of the alumni have locations where the public come in and out. And as a result, they're not happy with business insurance. And, uh, you know, they are lobbying, lobbying very hard uh, to change the rules uh, and the law with respect to fairness uh, with businesses who suffer uh, uh, excessive claims or fraudulent claims. And, and these are the type of topics that are coming up in terms of discussions. And we have our own group, our WhatsApp group, which is excellent. And you get to hear about people's successes. Uh, and it drives, you know, if you're part of that type of club, it's a great club to be part of. But... It was great, actually, that going back to the start of this, it was great for my parents at 75 years of age to go to City West last year to attend. And I've never seen my father in a tux, but he was looking quite dapper on the evening, I can tell you. I'd say he was. And, and, and my brothers were there, my four younger brothers uh, and my family. And, and I, I, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience. And I suppose, you know, it's the kind of a culmination, let's say, in terms of, of, of your travel through the career. There's probably only one thing left that I'd like to do, which is try and get Amarenko into a position with my colleagues where we would be an IPO candidate and see that. Well, I, I'm looking at your that. predictions. I'm yeah. looking at your predictions for the future of energy provision in Ireland. And, yes. and I'm going to let you make the statement of what you believe it is by 2030. Uh, by 20, 2030, we will have... Uh, 70% of our electricity coming from renewables. You will see solar parks um, as you drive through the countryside. Um, hopefully not too many because we're supposed to visually uh, uh, block them from people on the roads. Um, but you will see them. Uh, you will see, um, I think, movement, would you believe, to hydrogen cars and not electric cars. So anybody who's bought a Tesla can probably need to think again. Because by 2030, I do believe that liquid hydrogen, green hydrogen is going to overtake it because uh, there are issues, in my view, around lithium mine going forward. Um, whereas hydrogen is just created from water and electrolysis. It's a very simple process. So my sense John, is that you see hydrogen uh, uh, replacing electric vehicles going forward. And I think there's a lot of discussion in the ether about that, to, to excuse the pun. Um, John Mullins, uh, Chief Executive Chairman of Amarenko Solar. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I have no doubt that you are the future right now of uh, renewable energy. And uh, as you continue to dominate uh, the space, congratulations and Thank you. Uh, best of luck. Thank you, Sonia. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and watching Architects of Business made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to the team here at Joe and of course to our entrepreneur today, John Mullins. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe to get brand new shows directly into your feed.